we would make um, when I was working at VMware. Um, first things to be aware of, um, there is NSX um, V and NSX T. Um, NSX V is end of life. Um, anyone still using NSX V these days um, will be operating either out of maintenance or on some sort of extended support agreement with VMware. Um, and they probably have a bit of a problem on their hands trying to get from V to T. Um, NSXT is the, the current version of NSX. Um, as of recording, the current version is 3.2. Um, version 4 is scheduled for the end of um, 2022. Um, and for clarity, um, the T in NSXT doesn't actually stand for anything. Um, as a bit of trivia, um, it actually internally stands for transformers. Oop. Um, as in the robots. Um, so every code version or every release version of NSXT has got a different Transformers name associated with it. Apart from that, it doesn't stand for anything. Um, the big difference with NSX V versus T is that the V in here really stands for um, vCenter. Um, it was a vCenter specific deployment. NSXT supports obviously multiple vCenter servers as well. Um, which is a good thing compared to NSXV, which was pretty much limited to a single vCenter deployment. Um, it supports um, KVM as well, and we're going to go through and just sort of clarify a few of these things here as well. It supports bare metal. Um, it supports cloud as well, cloud deployments. Um, so we'll go through and touch base on some of these as well. Um, there's probably a couple other ones I'll think of as well, but it doesn't support... Um, there's no support for Hyper-V. There's no support for uh, Nutanix. So we'll cross these out as well. So really we can discount some of these other non-VMware based hypervisors as well. KVM support was removed in 3.2, so we can get rid of that as well. Cloud support, I'll sort of put a dotted line through this. Um, I've never seen anyone deploy the cloud integration with NSX T and the current supported version or the current capabilities they have are really unsupportable by VMware um, and they are looking to move to a new type of deployment architecture which is going to be uh, a cloud-based NSXT controller which will have better integration with, um, with cloud services. So really when it comes down to it, you're really looking at support for a limited subset of things. So obviously VMware vCenter integration um, and some bare metal integration as well. Um, and there's a couple of ways that they can integrate bare metal. So we'll, we'll go through and touch base on those as well and um, hopefully provide some clarity on this. So inside a uh, NSX environment, if we look at an existing um, brownfield deployment, and we've got two ESX hypervisors. So you will have in the customer environment, they may be running um, vSphere 6.5, um, 6.7, and the current release, which is 7.0. And then towards the end of the year, they'll push to, uh, move out to version eight as well. So really no one should be running 6.5. There is examples of customers with 6.5 and, and 5.5 and, and earlier releases out there, but um, NSXT does support 6.5, 6.7, 7.0, but you'll find that most customers are probably you know, somewhere around here. Um, when you deploy NSX, there is a a software vSwitch so that the distributed virtual switch sits in here and there's different versions of the switch as well so if you're running a, a 6.7 environment you'll have a, a version 6.7 um, switch at the, at the greatest release level um, and obviously if you're running version 7 you will have um, a version 7 switch or the capability to deploy a, a version 7 switch so in this type of environment if you're running 6.7 you'll have your VDS and if you have NSX installed, you'll have an NVDS, the N standing for NSX. When you move into a version 7 environment, they have this thing called a, a converged VDS. Um, I'll write, oh, this is not really called a, a CVDS, but um, the name for it really is a VDS. Um, but version 7 capabilities have converged all the different types of switches they have, the standard switch, the VDS, the NVDS, into one code base, which is now the uh, the, the VDS again. So if you're running a 6.7 environment, you'll have to have two different types of switches, a VDS and an NVDS, uh, one to support 
legacy port groups and one to support NSX enabled network segments. With a version seven deployment, you've got a converged VDS that can support legacy port groups and NSX um, segments at the same time. So ideally, VMware will be pushing customers to get to a version seven deployment. Um, they can re reuse the NICs they have in place um, without having to go through the complexity and the extra steps that would be involved around deploying additional hardware um, or cabling up additional interfaces inside that, um, that hypervisor or the compute node inside the network. So inside the networking environment, um, let's draw some switches here as well. Um, the switch vendor really um, you know, is irrelevant um, once we get to NSX, but if we've got an existing deployment, uh, you know, best case scenario, you're gonna have a couple of necks going to a diverse set of, of switches, um, either the top of rack or the, or the leaf location, depending on, on the architecture. I'll just draw a, a very simple solution here as well. Do this. Right, so typically we would be presenting a VLAN into the network um, if we're running um, you know, in an existing vSphere deployment without NSX running. Now obviously you would also have um, vCenter running here as well. So I'm just going to write VC for that. Um, and vCenter would be you know, in some sort of redundant sort of design as well. So you'd have multiple um, vCenter servers to you know, configure your ESX hosts. Right, down here. So this is you know, what we have, um, or what most customers would have right now if they're running a purely vCenter, or sorry, vSphere environment. Um, and they would have VMs running in here, connected to different port groups, and I can switch locally. Um, and if they need to get across the network, then the underlying network infrastructure needs to have end-to-end -end VLAN um, um, con uh, configuration. So right, we move on to looking at how we would deploy NSXT into this environment. Then NSXT would be a separate OVA. Now you'd have to have a cluster of three of these for a production deployment. So if we look at the scale requirements for each of these as a significant RAM and CPU overhead to deploy NSXT, um, the NSXT manager, um, and this is configured to communicate with obviously vCenter or multiple vCenter servers if they exist in the network. NSXT um, is pitched at a, as a security solution. Part of security um, really is around telemetry, um, logging capability, um, visibility around security events. NSXT manager itself is really just the, the, the manager, has the integrated control plane elements as well in that. Um, but to get any logging visibility, reporting capability, as of version 3.2, there is a separate NSX application platform that is deployed. Um, again, this is deployed um, with about three worker nodes, it is deployed as a Kubernetes cluster. There has to be an existing NS, sorry, an existing Kubernetes cluster um, made available by the customer. Um, it's not deployed as part of the NSXT installer. Um, they are looking to change this, but right now a customer would be expected to stand up Kubernetes um, infrastructure, controller, multiple worker nodes, um, each with about 64 gig of RAM uh, and about a terabyte of storage. So right now you've got three NSX manager controllers um, and then three NSX app platforms as well. So the app platform takes all the logging and telemetry in from the, uh, the NSX um, components in the network, as well as the telemetry, logging, IPS hits, um, application matches, you know, all those sorts of security things that a customer would typically expect to see. So we'll just draw some a dotted line here. It is integrated from a GUI perspective into the manager, so you don't have to log into the application platform. It's really just a back-end storage collection um, mediator to provide the visualization and, and logging and reporting capabilities. So you can see from this is a very significant overhead in deploying the infrastructure to operate and, and feed and water an NSXT deployment. So take that into consideration when you start looking at, um, or customers are looking at deploying this, um, you know, what the, the footprint is of this platform. Um, NSX is very good at keeping you know, demarcation between the traditional existing 
um, vSphere admins who can go about their business in here, um, configuring, maintaining workloads, um, attaching them to port groups and segments. Um, and also um, provide some separation for the network admins um, and the security admins really um, with current versions who spend their time in here. Um, so once NSXT is deployed inside the network, you configure it um, to talk to vCenter. Um, it then learns the ESX hosts that run inside the network. So it gets a list of all these. Then you get to selectively choose which of the um, VDSs will be upgraded to the NSX capable. So it's not a big bang approach. You can selectively choose this hypervisor and not this one. Um, so it does allow for some sort of migration capability as well. So I'm going to assume that this customer is running a, a version 7 environment. Um, and we've now configured NSX to communicate with these devices and we've enabled um, the VDS to have NSX capabilities. It would be a converged VDS at this point. Um, if it was running 6.7, then we would, I would change the diagram here to say NVDS, right? So the same capabilities would be present, um, but I'll base this on current software versions. So once we have that in place, um, we now have the ability to build a full mesh of tunnels between every hypervisor node in the network. So this happens pretty much automatically. Um, and there is a, an, an address, a subnet allocated for the, the transport network. Um, there is a VLAN also associated with that as well. So there is a common, you know, typically a common VLAN is shared for all the overlay tunnels, um, which is configurable as well as part of the transport group. Um, and if you have multiple interfaces, it will either be an active passive solution or a fully active active solution. So let's assume it's active active. Um, and we're going to build a tunnel from here and down here and up to here. All right, so we've got a, a single tunnel. Um, if NSX detects there's multiple interfaces attached to that transport zone, um, it will then go and build another tunnel to this one. So we get a fully redundant overlay mesh between every hypervisor in the network. Um, and they reside on a, a common shared transport VLAN. So there's very few VLANs required for this because um, it doesn't matter if you've got one segment or, or 100 segments or 1,000, um, they are, are separated um, with a VID um, and we have um, a common transport network. You could have multiple transport zones, multiple overlays if you want to as well, but typically you'd have just one transport zone. Right, all right, we attach these workloads to segments. So then we have, uh, we have communication back and forward over a tunnel. The tunnel we're using here is a, um, a Geneve tunnel. It is not using VXLAN. Um, Geneve, there is a, an RFC for it. It's a fully extensible um, tunnel overlay protocol. Um, it's not encrypted. There is no native encryption capability in this. Um, it is extensible, which is, I think, what the, the, um, one of the E stands for in Geneve. So instead of VXLAN, which is a fixed header, Geneve can be um, modified uh, through the life cycle of the, of the product and add more features as you need to. Um, it's UDP based. Um, so the underlying network infrastructure really just needs to be able to forward Geneve packets uh, from point A to point B. Um, because it does have a variable header length, um, typically VMware will specify that 1700 bytes is what they would look to, like to see for the underlying uh, physical network infrastructure. Um, so you don't have to do any um, any um, any fragmentation of the of the Geneve payload. All right, so we'll put that down here. All right. Cool. So really, we have a situation now where we have the ability for devices to communicate to each other, um, purely just you know, routed or switched across the network. I haven't talked about security yet, um, and we'll touch on security shortly as well. So. At this stage, we need to better leave the network as well. So um, there may be a device sitting outside the network that wants to really communicate to um, you know, somewhere inside the network. It could be a, a user inside the network. Um, it could be somewhere sitting, someone sitting out on the internet. Um, so we need to better convert from the world of, of you know, native IP addresses um, and map those through into the Geneve network. So we've got our yellow network segment here. Um, so let's just call this the, you know, the web segment which has an IP you know, subnet of 10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10.10
and dot zero dot zero is left over there. So the VDS is also responsible for doing things like um, DHCP address allocation. It can automatically allocate addresses. It will learn addresses as well. So it's doing snooping on the on the VNX. Um, so if this guy's been allocated um, ten, he's got eleven, he's got twenty. Um, the controller is aware of where these are as well, so it knows how you know to get from ten to eleven. Obviously, has to just maintain local communications through the BDS, um, and to reach um, twenty, then it has two tunnels that can forward traffic down. VMware prefer to have um, any load balancing and ECMP capabilities and things like that taking place inside the BDS and not being configured inside the switching layer um, underneath. So, it's a native IP connection. There is an IP address sitting. Um, there's an IP address sitting here, and there's also an IP address sitting here. So it really is layer three directly into the BDS and then overlay between them. So the tunnels actually go from you know, X here to, to Z, right, um, across the network. So it's fully layer three right into the BDS. Um, they want to take care of any link aggregation and things like that directly inside the BDS um, and have the underlying network fabric be as, as simple as possible, just a basic IP fabric. Um, doesn't need to have VXLAN on it, it just can be IP, IP based forwarding. Spinal Leap is great, we get, you know, there's obviously equal hops between everything, predictable latency, throughput, etc. So this is great. Um, now we need to try and leave the network. So um, there's an edge gateway component which is deployed by, by NSX as well. Um, the edge gateway can be a virtual machine or it can be a bare metal server. 99% of the time it is deployed as a virtual machine. There is different scales of that VM. There's a small, medium, large type scenario. Uh, the medium one, I think, does about two gigabits a second of throughput. The large one will do 10 gigabits a second of throughput. So you really have to take into consideration the, the throughput requirements. Um, but really that gateway um, edge node virtual machine is responsible for, for north-south communication flows. So I'm just gonna draw um, Draw this upside down. We you, you probably have this machine connected into your um into your into your leaf nodes as well. I'm just going to draw it connected in, into the spine, which is you know probably not technically how you do it, but it, for the sake of this diagram, it probably makes things a bit easier. So it's a very similar setup. You've got a you've got a, an NSX enabled um, VDS running inside here. Um, you would deploy a a virtual machine in here, which is the NSX Gateway VM. So this is responsible for really mapping from Geneva um, back and forward to you know, the world of, of VLANs and, and IP and things like that, right? So the Edge Gateway VM actually serves several functions. It can be a Layer 3 gateway, it can also be a Layer 2 gateway, um, and bridge between Geneva and, um, and VLANs as well, So and provide gateway services for that segment as well. So we've got our, our, um, our Edge VM here, um, and when we have this deployed as well, you'll have now have tunnels kind of like this. Right, so we'll have tunnels automatically formed between here uh, and here. So this full mesh is automatically extended. Um, once again, the underlying network, the blue network here, is just responsible for, for forwarding traffic. Um, it doesn't really get involved in any routing decisions. Um, it's just all sitting on the same, on the same transport VLAN. Um, versions prior to 3.2 had multiple transport zones, one's for edge node infrastructure and one for the, the host side of things. Um, as of 3.2, you can converge those into a single VLAN for transport nodes as well. Um, you can make this simple or as complicated as you want to. So your edge VM here really is, it's a, it's a BGP based, well, it's a, it's a software router, supports um, OSPF, BGP, static routes, etc. It's actually just running on, um, free range routing. So if you go and look at the, the FRR website, um, you'll see that um, VMware is a one of the primary supporters of the free range routing, free range routing um, software. Uh, and if you dig into the, the virtual machine, um, which is the NSX uh, gateway, um, you'll start seeing configurations that look very much like um, FRR. Right, cool. Um, so we've got a, you know, a router sitting inside our network. What color should we use for this one? Like this blue to match our physical infrastructure over here, right? So let's just say this is a, a Cisco router. Um, you would have a, 
appearing connection into here, which can be a, another separate physical interface, or it could just be a, a VLAN that's coming back through this part of the network up in here. So how you choose to provide that sort of um, southern sort of connection in here as well is up to you. Um, and then once we have this network segment, for example, so this network segment here, um, there's a box you can tick to advertise that route, just like on a, any other router, and then 10. 10.0.0/24 will be advertised through a BGP update um, into this part of the network. It can be sitting in a default VRF on the, the NSX gateway. You can have um, multiple VRFs in there as well and advertise it through EVPN. Um, but I'll just keep it simple. It's a, just a standard BGP advertisement for an IPv4 route. It obviously supports IPv6 as well. So now when this user wants to get to one of these machines, he comes through and follows his routing table hits this, this router here, um, router then follows its, um, the next hop into the, the NSX gateway. The NSX gateway says, right, you want to get to 10.0.10. Okay, we go across this tunnel up to here. And likewise, if you want to get to 20, up through here. So it will load balance um, across both of these tunnels as well. So if you've got multiple links into the, the hypervisor, uh, the more links you have, the more uh, capacity you have through here as well from flow based forwarding. Um, so, the way they scale it out is by adding more links into this. And if you've got an edge VM here that say can support 10 gig a second of throughput and you want more throughput capability at the edge of the network, then you can add another edge node VM here as well. And this forms a an edge cluster. And that edge cluster, uh, hold on, we can catch into here as well. So we'll now have be receiving two copies of this route, one from this edge node VM, one from this. So this router here will be using, or should be configured to be using ECP, ECMP, um, and be forwarding you know, across multiple links. So we now have gone from 10 gigabits a second of throughput to essentially 20. Um, and if this was bare metal, that, that would talk about having potentially you know, 70 gig a second of throughput on a bare metal node that's appropriately configured with the right um, CPU, the right specific interfaces. So you can have, I think it's eight members as an as a edge node cluster, we could scale this out horizontally, um, and that edge node cluster can reside across multiple um, hypervisors as well. So you could do, and often you would do this, and you'd have the same configuration taking place here as well, right? And that can, they can be geographically dispersed as well. So this edge node cluster here um, will be configured as a cluster like this. It will have its own BGP AS. Um, and as far as everything connected to it is concerned, um, it thinks it's talking to one router. So this will be supported as well. You now have four copies of this route appearing inside your network, and then you've got multiple ways to get into the network and multiple ways to reach this 1010-24 you know, network down here as well. Cool, so that's how they would configure that. Um, this could be sitting in one data center. This could be sitting in another data center as well. Uh, it's up to you how you configure that. Um, so this is really from a purely routed environment. When we start looking at um, north-south gateway security through here, um, there is uh, flow synchronization taking place, but it's really, I believe, only between two members of a cluster as well. So you have to sort of start being careful around asymmetric traffic flows from a security perspective when you've got um, an edge node cluster that consists of more than two members. All right, so we now have taken care of how, how do we map uh, from the network segments in here um, to the outside world of that wants to speak IP. Um, and now we need to sort of probably touch on some, some other use cases around how do we take care of, of bare metal workloads inside the network. So I've got a couple of scenarios where I've got you know, a legacy bare metal server which cannot be virtualized. Um, they have a network agent, which is a piece of software that's installed on here, which provides a software NIC. Um, it is connected into the network somehow. Um, and this software driver is supported on Windows um, and Linux-based servers, provided they are you know, current versions of Windows, um, Red Hat, Debian, Oracle Linux, um, etc. 
would be targets for this. Um, so you have to really install the software on here. The NSX manager up here is, is responsible for configuring these agents as well. So it will put, you can actually force routing configurations into it. So I'm gonna have map some traffic to the underlay, some traffic to the overlay. Um, and we have Geneve tunnels that are, are built into here as well. So again, I'll be having you know this sort of carry on. So the Geneve tunnels will be terminating directly inside that software driver. Um, I'm not, you know, depending on the configuration, not directly attached to the underlay. I'm attached to the network segments that are configured from NSX. Having said that, um, I've never seen anyone deploy this in production in Anger. Um, I've tried it in the lab. It's not something I want to have, actually ever have to support. And typically, I think that the, the operators of these legacy machines here, these these bare metal servers, would be pretty reluctant to have a piece of software here acting as the, the network interface. Um, whether it's from a performance perspective or supportability, um, it's not really something that's, that's done. Um, the other option is the edge gateway can act as a layer two bridge. Um, so I could deploy a, an edge node. Where am I gonna draw it? Let's just draw it here. So again, another edge node software that's connected into the network. Um, let's just say this hypervisor here is plugged in here. And then I can have workloads sitting back here that are on you know, their own individual VLANs and they get mapped into here. So they'll be plugged into the physical infrastructure here, but let's say VLAN 100, 200, 300. And you can choose to say that anything on VLAN 400 is also on this network segment as well. So you've got the ability to map a, VLAN, a layer two broadcast domain to a network segment and also provide a distributed gateway capability inside here as well. So I could put my default route on here as well for each of these network subnets. That's a bit stupid. Right. Okay, so bridging, routing, legacy network segments um, that are on individual VLANs, which can be used for legacy workloads, can also be used from a migration perspective to br bring um, even legacy virtual machine infrastructure into a newer greenfield deployment of NSXT as well. So this is probably the more likely scenario that gets used for migrations um, and to support existing machines. The, the agent really um, is not something that really gets used. Um, feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, but I've not seen this deployed in any of my customers when I was running, um, when I was working at VMware. So, so far we've focused on looking at NSX from a you know, layer two, layer three, how do we integrate with um, existing network infrastructure? Um, and ultimately, what does this look like um, at the end of the day? So if we look at the, the network, the fabric we have built here, Spin this around. Right, so this is the IP based fabric um, that was on the previous page. Right, so VMware doesn't really care what is going on under the hood here, provided that you know, the tunnel endpoint A can talk to tunnel endpoint B. That's all it wants to do. So the tunnels are formed from hypervisor to hypervisor, hypervisor to edge gateway. Um, whether that edge ga gateway is providing layer three connectivity or providing layer two connectivity. So really all the solution all the solution does is build a full mesh of tunnels between hypervisors um, and edge nodes across the network. And then each of those devices is capable of you know, sending and receiving different types of traffic, whether it's VLANs, um, integrating with existing routing protocols or just um, you know, ethernet traffic from one, one um, workload to another. So if we look at, um, Right, what color I have green for these. Right, so our right, and they plug into the network. So I'm just going to draw a single nick here. It could be multiple nicks, obviously. Um, and we've got our BDS is sitting here as well, which are NSX enabled, and they're still called a BDS as of version 3.2 just to confuse people. Um, right, so this is how I would sort of depict it. The IP fabric really um, can be any vendor, Cisco, Arista, Juniper, 
whatever, it could be ACI. Um, it just needs to be able to forward from one IP address to another um, on a common VLAN. So you can have really quite a few, you know, just three or four VLANs inside your fabric, one for the transport zone, one for management traffic, one for vMotion, potentially one for IP storage, um, and that would be it. So the goal would be to have a very simple fabric-based network solution. And all the smarts from a routing security perspective, um, even services like address translation, uh, DHCP address allocation are now handled directly in a distributed fashion across the VDS. So we've got our, our vCenter server here, vCenter server cluster, we've got our NSX um, sort of stack sitting here as well, which you know, these two are communicating to each other here as well. Um, and they're talking down here as well. They both sort of talk down to the underlying infrastructure. Right, so when we start looking at security, we've got our VMs that were present before, and they are attached um, with VNIX into the VDS. And this is where the security elements take place, right? So there is essentially a transparent firewall that sits inside the VNIC. Now this is all running inside the kernel from a security perspective. There was plans when I was there to push some of the capabilities directly into the, uh, the hypervisor's operating system in, in user land, uh, but there is no virtual machines to provide security. It is all sitting in the kernel or resident inside the host operating system of the hypervisor. Um, so the goal here or the, what they'll tell you is that um, you've got security happening um, outside of the host workload. Um, it's sitting inside the kernel where it's you know, a lot more protected apparently from you know, someone gaining access to a workload. So these um, firewall instances here um, obviously support stateful layer four security capability. Um, obviously the VDS is already doing, does layer two and layer three, so it can actually do um, access control list type security as well. So stateless security at layer two, if you want that, um, it is doing routing as well. So this VDS is no longer really just a, a switch. Um, it is a fully distributed router um, so it has capability to make writing decisions um, and then start enforcing security by having stateful um, layer 4 firewalling. And you move up the, the, the chain as well, so URL filtering, um, application ID. The application ID signature pack is, is quite small. It's targeted at um, data center based workloads, so several thousand signatures. Um, that can be enforced across here, but it's not really looking at the broader um, security signatures or application signatures from a next generation firewall that would be spanning um, you know, campus type deployments. Although there was talk of that actually being increased when I was, um, when I was there. Um, AD integration, which is um, not a full blown um, solution like you get in say a Palo Alto, but there is limited um, AD integration capabilities as well. Um, address translation, um, and then starting to look at things like IDS and IPS as well, which was um, was added um, in the 3.0 release. So you've got this security capability that sort of sits out here that is directly taking place on the VNIC, so nothing can go from one VM to another VM without passing through these firewall instances that sit inside here. Um, and just like with um, the Pensando solution, um, we, are, you know, we have the capability here to leverage uh, metadata from the workloads, um, so that the name of the of the um, the VM using regular expressions as well. Um, what VNIC is attached to, what segments attached to. Um, strangely enough, NSXT does not import security tags from vCenter. Um, NSXT wants to be the the master of all the security tagging across the infrastructure, so it will, will read tags in from um, cloud services when it's integrated with cloud services, read but it won't read in tags from vCenter. So. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a conundrum. Um, they will let you create security tags inside NSX that match um, certain workload types as well. So um, you can't leverage those currently. Um, right, so we have security enforcement here and you will build security policy to say, you know, if I've got some VMs there, say their, um, their name matches yeah, database. Now I've got database one, database two, and I've got a machine called you know, app one, right? I can build a policy that says DB can talk to app, right? And just basically create um, groups 
that drop these into the relevant spaces. And it will, if I automatically add in new um, workloads, um, it will dynamically learn those if it matches or drop those in and, and do that immediately. Right, carrying on, had to stop someone from bouncing a ball outside my window. Right, so there's a very um, sort of cloud-like way of creating uh, firewall policy, top-down firewall policy editor, if you know how to use a traditional firewall, it's the same case. So security enforcement here is really that, that east-west security enforcement model. Um, with security, it goes all the way from essentially stateless layer two access control lists um, layer 4, stateful firewalling, um, IDS, IPS. What, when, what it doesn't do here is um, any sort of TLS uh, decryption, um, re-encryption um, of traffic. So if the majority of the traffic inside the data center is already encrypted using um, TLS or SSL, um, then there's no point running um, IDS across it. Um, so that's sort of a, a limited sort of um, capability at this stage. They do have the capability of doing TLS decryption, um, inspecting payloads, re-encrypting it, but that only takes place at um, the edge of the network. So if we have the edge nodes that we had before running inside our network, um, sit down here, um, they are capable of providing um, north-south security. Right, so this is north-south and this is known as the, the gateway firewall. So the NSX is what sits down here. So this has more and more capabilities as well. They've added in capabilities to do, um, obviously you can do things like, you can do the same capabilities you've got up here, right? So layer four, you've got IDS, IPS, but they've added in things like TLS capabilities as well. So there's more and more capabilities going into this layer of the network because this is a software-based virtual machine or a virtual firewall that can have a lot more capabilities embedded into that. Um, beyond what they can really achieve inside the kernel um, of the hypervisor. So this is where a lot of it, the heavy lifting will take place um, moving forward. Um, and you can cluster these as well. So, and there is limitations around that clustering capability as well. So, because they want to maintain session state as well. So probably keep that in mind um, from, a, from a security competitive position. Um, the goal for them will be to look to remove third-party physical firewalls. So if you've got Fortinet, Palo Alto, Checkpoint, um, they will say that you know they want to be the replacement for that perimeter firewall that's offering north-south security services inside the data center. And you'll be having you know, your connections into your existing um, infrastructure, um, which is typically BGP, supports LSPF, um, in the 3.0 release as well. Um, that was to fall in line with what NSXB did, that supported LSPF only, so they had to really support that from a migration perspective. So we've got our, our tunnels here. We've got a tunnel coming through from here. So you've got this full mesh of tunnels taking place here. There could be multiple tunnels taking place in here as well. Um, and there could be multiple edge nodes that provide layer three services. There could be an edge node that provides layer two services in here as well. Um, and then you've got the, the, the next gen sort of visibility stuff is taking place up in here inside the NSX um, application platform, also known as NSX Intelligence, um, which is really a subset of its features. So we'll call that Intel. Um, and that's the footprint that's required up here to do this. So this is the, the se distributed security capability. Um, traffic will enter down through the, the gateway firewall here. Um, it will then be um, security being enforced north-south in here as well. And we can have east-west security taking place here, and they will sit there and talk about, you know, again, um, you know, eighty percent of the traffic inside this data center will be east-west traffic, so exactly the same use cases that um, Pensando will be talking about as well. Protect that unprotected eighty percent of traffic, have zero trust directly inside the VNIC. Um, the underlying IP fabric network infrastructure is completely irrelevant. Um, it could be from one vendor, it could be multiple vendors, it could be legacy infrastructure provided it can forward um, IP packets across the network um, and meet the minimum MTU requirement, which is um, pretty simple for them. That's all they'd really need. Um, right, what else is on here? That's 
Okay, I guess the only other thing to talk about really is just the RV load balancer. So RV is deployed as um, yet another piece of software. So you have the RV manager, um, which can be redundant as well. And that RV manager is responsible for talking into, um, it will talk to NSX. Uh, you can also go and configure it to communicate with virtual, um, with vCenter as well. It can also talk to Amazon Web Services, Azure, etc., um, and Kubernetes deployments and things as well. So you've got this single management device that um, is providing reading information about the workloads, the network segments um, that are that are that are um, configured inside these environments, and treats NSX just like another cloud. Um, and it will go and automatically spin up infrastructure. So if you've got some workloads sitting inside your your VMware environment, um, it will go and deploy a an RV. Um, this VM inside here. Um, it will coordinate with NSXT or vCenter to attach to the correct port group or segment um, as it needs to. So if I configure my my web servers or my application servers or whatever for a, a different network, say 20 dot, yeah, just choosing some random number here. Um, as soon as I configure this, then that network will be presented and advertised through BGP out here. Right. And if I want to draw traffic up to one of these machines here, it will sit there and represent, um, say, 20.10, 20 .20 and that's going to be load balancing between my 10.10, whatever it was, 10.10 and 10.11. Right. So it would do some pretty complicated you know, load balancing capabilities here, um, and it will dynamically spawn or spin up additional um, VMs as well as it needs to. Um, so if I say I need to hit a certain target of you know, 50 gigabits a second, each of those VMs will be spun up um, across multiple hypervisors as needed um, and scale out that load balancing capability and scale down as it needs to as well. So when you configure the NSX load balancer, um, there was the NSX um, basic load balancer, then NSX advanced. This is the product, this is the capability that was built into NSX from I think probably version one or version two, um, and NSX Advanced Load Balancer is RB. Um, it is integrated, this is integrated into the product. Um, this is going to go away. This is end of life really as of 3.2. New deployments, greenfield deployments of NSX um, have to deploy the RB capability. You do get RB, um, you do get the basic version of this. So there's two different tiers, um, like the basic one and Enterprise, I think. Um, this is included for free with um, a NSXT purchase, uh, but it does not support things like SSL um, offload. Um, it has a very limited sort of capabilities around what it can and can't do. Um, so they'll be talking you know, people into the enterprise version of this pretty quickly. So you can see there's a, a very large footprint of, of, of control plane and management elements that sit across the top here. Um, there is single pane of glass management um, in NSXT, so you can manage workloads, RV based or load balancing configuration inside NSX. It'll then push the configuration through API calls into RV, um, which will then close the loop and make that configuration change. But this is really focused on NSX workloads. Um, if you want to go and configure load balancing services inside cloud based services, you're still going to have to reside inside um, the RV controller as well. RV can operate fully standalone. It doesn't need to have any other VMware infrastructure in place. Um, it can manage, you can even manage bare metal um, load balancers as well, which they can build with this platform as well. So it's sort of different discrete parts of it have been cobbled together. Um, there is XDR capabilities coming as well, um, which again relies heavily on this sort of NSX application or intelligence platform that sits up here as well. And more and more features are getting pushed into this down here as well um, at the NSX gateway firewall capability. So this is really, um, you know, where I see things happening. Um, there is obviously evolution around Project Monterey, uh, which will be supporting SmartNICs from, from Pensando and, and obviously from NVIDIA as well. Um, and that's that'll be released in several phases. Um, so phase one, you know, phase two, I haven't seen the latest version of what the different phases are, but really initially you're gonna look at things like moving 
switching capabilities down into the um, smart NIC. If it's detected during the installation of ESX i8, um, it'll give you the option to say, hey, you've got a, a smart NIC in here. Do you want to start leveraging it? It actually deploys what's called ESX um, IO directly onto that smart NIC as well. And you get a the same look and feel you would get from the hypervisor from, from the console. You can log into the ESX portion of it, um, but the VDS is deployed there as well as a VDS on the XA6 side and the VDS on the smart NIC. Um, and you can switch between them. And then things like stateful firewalling as well. Where we move down here. Then through the life cycle of the evolution, they'll be adding things like, you know, let's say IPS down here, maybe IPSec, right? So there is a, an evolution to add more and more capabilities um, and through various phases of this as well. Right, so that's really covered off NSX, I guess, fundamentals, looking at how things are, are plumbed in together, um, the overlays between hypervisors, edge gateways, providing layer three services, edge gateways, bridging layer two um, broadcast domains, providing gateway services for routing from those as well. Um, simplification of the IP fabric underneath the entire network. Um, and then looking at how the security is embedded directly into the kernel um, and then the gateway services, the software VM that sits at the edge augmenting the, to provide north-south um, security. Um, and finally, wrapping up with RV from a load balancing perspective. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, if you've got any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to see if I can help um, with opportunities um, to displace this. Um, obviously from a Pensando solution um, with the smart services which we're sitting in here, but key to this and probably something to be aware of is that NSX doesn't provide security for everything. So there's no, no protection for, uh, for storage traffic that's coming out of here as well. There's no protection for the, the management traffic that's often um, plumbed into the back of these things. Management traffic, storage traffic, legacy port groups on the VDS as well can't be protected. So obviously the IP fabric has to consist of some switches so we can provide those uh, we can integrate into NSX if we need to, um, well, providing the overlay, well, the underlay capabilities for the, the Geneva tunnels. We could even build a security policy that just allows their UDP, GDP, uh, Geneva based tunnels to exist on the network and nothing else. Um, and then also provide security enforcement for um, these parts of the network as well as, you know, where it's too difficult to actually deploy agents or things like that, we can actually provide capabilities around here. So let's focus our sort of attention on you know, these things, uh, even protecting this overlay as well, right? Right, so I hope that was helpful. Um, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Bye.